So you seem to have made a permanent spot out of where you are. Do you do all your Zoom conferences from there? What, me? Yep. From my office? Um, yeah, because the Zoom at home is subject to interruption all the time. So I tend to come in and do it here. There are always dogs leaping up on me or people banging on the door, delivering cases of wine, things like that. So it's, it's safer to have it <laughs> in my office here. So um, we'll start now because the IT persons tell me that we're live. Uh, let me start by offering my warmest endearments to everyone who's, who's turned up for this uh, evening discussion, book launch and book discussion. Um, my name is Ankit Malhotra. I'm the co-founder and president of the Jindal Society of International Law. Uh, today, we'll discuss, we'll also launch the magnum opus by Professor uh, Gary Simpson, his book entitled Sentimental Life of International Law, Literature, Language and Longing in World Politics. Professor Simpson was appointed to a chair in public international law at LSE in January 2016. He previously taught at the University of Melbourne, the Australian National University and has held varying visiting positions at uh, Melbourne University, NYU and also Harvard. He's also the author of Great Paths and Outlaw States, and which was published in Cambridge, uh, Cambridge University Press in 2004. He's also the winner of the American Society of International Law's annual prize for creative scholarship in 2005. And he's also written uh, Law of War and Crimes, War Crime Trials and the Reinvention of International Law. And he's also co-edited with uh, Professor Kevin Von Heller of Hidden Histories in 2014. And he's also written Who's Afraid of International Law? Uh, he's also a fellow of the British Academy. We also have amongst us Dr. Madeline Kem, uh, who's an Associate Dean of Learning and Teaching and Senior Lecturer at La Trobe, La Trobe Law School. Her research examines the relationship between um, between the aspects of law, specifically in her particular interest of international law in Australian life. These research interests are drawn together in a book, International Law and Public Debate, uh, which is published in 2021. Professor Madeline, Dr. Madeline has also contributed to the Oxford Bibliographies on International Law and her work has been published in journals including the London Review of International Law, Journal of Conflict and Security Law and Griffith Law Review. Dr. Madeline is also a regular member of the faculty of the Harvard Law School Institute for Global, Global Law and Policy Workshop, a founding member of the Latrobe International Law Studies Research Group and a member of the Executive Council of the Australian and New Zealand Society of International Law. We also have amongst us Mr. Ram Chandran Madan, who graduated from Symbiosis Law School in Pune in 2017, after which he pursued his master's at LSE in 2018, where he read under Professor Simpson and other distinguished faculty members. During his time in London, he was also associated with the Nuff College, where he was a recipient of the Good Enough Entry Scholarship. He was also enrolled as an advocate at the Bar Council in, of Delhi in 2017 and started his litigation practice, which he continues to do now. Uh, with those words, I'll now invite Professor Simpson to offer reflections and also a description of the book, following which we'll have uh, analysis, critique, and a discussion by our panelists. So the floor is yours. Well, um, thanks, Ankit, and, and thanks to you all um, for joining this session. And thanks to Ram and, and Maddie for being my interlocutors on, on, on this occasion. So I thought it might be a good idea to talk about the subtitle of the book um, first and then just make some general reflections on the content of the book. Um, but... Uh, before I do, I, I mean, I, I've had this experience now of launching the book and being interviewed and interrogated about it in various places around, mainly around the UK. I'm about to take it on its overseas trip soon, though. Um, and I feel 
uh, I feel like I'm in a way. I feel like I'm ready to write the book now. Uh, I, I, I I won't. I mean, I won't write a sort of sentimental life, international law volume two. But I'm very tempted to because I feel like I know much more about the subject now, which is after all the subject of how people go about thinking and living in international law. So I, th- I feel like I know a lot more about the subject now than I did when I wrote the book. So. The, book was a kind of abstract intellectual exercise in some ways compared to the uh, ethnographic experiences I've been having in the last few months with the book as a kind of material artifact in material places. So this is very exciting, but also has to be, I think, resisted because otherwise one would just keep recessively repeating one's own work over and over again through the years. So turning to the subtitle, the, the, the subtitle is language, uh, uh, literature, language and longing in world politics. And um, I'll just say something about each of these three categories uh, by way of introducing the book. So, I mean, first of all, um, literature. Uh, so there's a there's, of course, a literature and law movement, uh, a movement that reads or fillets literature for law. So we look at Charles Dickens, for example, or or Shakespeare, and try and figure out what they had to say about law or legal process or legal life. I'm not exactly doing that, but not, nor am I averse to it. So as some of the reviewers so far have, have said, it's sort of sprinkled with literary allusions, both explicit and and implicit. Uh, and some people find that very annoying. Other people like it a lot. Um, that's just a sort of thing I'm doing. I'm, I'm sort of performing a certain form of rather traditional law and literature. I'm not so much, though, trying to discover law in that literature, but rather using that literature as a way of enlivening my own experience in legal practice and legal thought. So it's not as if I'm reading Kafka and discovering that he'd written a book called The Trial and talking about trials and so on. It's, it's, it's more glancingly elusive than that. So that's one way of approaching law and literature. But a second way um, is to sort of think about law as, um, as a particular way or, or means of communication. And um, I mean, here I turn to the kind of language part of the story. So international law, as you all know, is not really like other legal orders or legal regimes. You know, it lacks the basic equipment of the legal order. It it doesn't have, it doesn't really have courts. We sort of pretend it does. It doesn't have a police. uh, It doesn't have a legislative assembly. Uh, It's got imitations of all of these, but we know deep down in our hearts that that's not the real thing. Whatever we tell the students each year in order to encourage them to continue in the class. So what we have left over, I think, is a kind of form of rhetoric or language or discourse. Um, We've got a way of thinking and seeing and experiencing and living in the world that we call international law. And it seems to me that that way of thinking and speaking is extraordinarily powerful, as many international legal scholars have shown or argued over the last 20, 30 years. Um, so the conventional view of international law is often that it's, it's sort of weak but charming. Um, my view is that it can be quite charmless at times and very powerful. So its power is derived, though, from its from 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 its 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 category as a language, from its persuasive force. And you know, it's not as if I'm the first person to come along and notice that it's a language. But it's funny that that people who've described it as a language have not really looked at it using the classic tools of you know linguistic theory or literary theory. And actually, neither have I. I've just written a sort of suggestive list of ways of going about that task. I haven't actually performed that task in any meaningful, in any meaningful way. So I'm, I'm offering a series of hints, uh, really. Uh, so in, indirection is, in fact, one of the methods of the, of the book. So it's a way of saying, if you read this and decide you want to head down this road, then head down this road. I, I wish you well. I'm not going to be saying you've gone down the wrong road. This is not what my book meant. So... So I did want to see it as a way of approaching language. And of course, you know, I use some very old fashioned literary techniques first, like uh, irony, comedy, 
and bathos. Um, so I was very uh, dedicated to the idea of defamiliarizing international law by applying some unfamiliar literary devices to it. Who could have thought that international law might be sort of funny or bathetic? And um, this idea of uh, bathos, for example, prompted me into an examination of why international law is so often a law of disappointment, why it moves precisely, um, as Alexander Pope would have said, from, from the sublime to the mundane, really, rather than ridiculous, as the cliche goes. So, you know, it offers a sort of form of sublime justice, see my field of international criminal law, but then offers a kind of tawdry experience uh, of witnessing a trial that, that sort of goes wrong or becomes procedural or leaves victims sort of devastated and, and disappointed. And I think, you know, when it comes to language, we can see this in relation to, say, the war in Ukraine. So Ukraine war is one of these moments where international law is all over the front pages again. And in many ways, I think the war on Ukraine and the rhetoric around it and the uses of international law, I mean, some of my colleagues want to call these abuses. I just think of them as uses of international law have really brought out some of the problems of the whole international legal system very, very starkly for me. The way it can be recruited to an extraordinarily punitive set of prescriptions in relation to war, the way that it trades in sort of moral absolutes and moral superiority in a way that sort of sacrifices the very people it's supposed to be trying to redeem or save. Think of all these references. Well, first of all, think of the way we are talking about the Ukraine war in the language of war crimes, crimes against humanity, genocide, aggression, territorial integrity, political sovereignty. I'd say none, none of these six ideas are in any way useful for thinking about the war in Ukraine. And I think most of them are downright damaging. So I think we've got to take it seriously as a, as a, a way or a mode by which people are encouraged to think about global politics in certain ways that they imagine to be um, somehow virtuous or promising because they're clothed in the ideals of legality or the rule of law, but have a sort of disturbing underpinning of also in this in, in this case I'll say sort of absolutism or sort of pr propagandism um, or punishment. So um, not that I want to speak about the Ukraine all day, but I would say that the whole rhetorical engagement over the Ukraine is largely at the moment between punishers and negotiators. Uh, and the punishers are very much winning out in the United Kingdom, at least. I don't know what it's like in Australia or India, but in the United Kingdom in particular, in the United States to a lesser extent, um, the idea really is to punish Russia by destroying its economy, to quote the French foreign minister, the finance minister recently, um, and to apply war crimes prosecutions to Vladimir Putin. It's clear to me that the political elites in the Anglo-American sphere are sort of dedicated neurotically to the punishment of Putin and Russia to almost the exclusion of all other considerations, either on the ground or geopolitically. So it's a sort of careless way of thinking and, and international law has been recruited to this particular endeavor. And it's been recruited as a language and that language is powerfully determinative. And we can see that very starkly in the current um, crisis. So I wanted in my own small way to sort of think about that uh, linguistic currency, if you like, in the literary terms. You know, how, does it, how did it work? How is it deployed? What are the sorts of questions international lawyers got, get asked? Why do they keep answering them? What would it be like not to answer those questions? Um, what does it mean to the authority and an expert position of the international lawyer, either to answer them or not to answer those sorts of questions? Um, so roughly speaking, an anthropology of my experience as an international lawyer over the last few years. Um, so that would be at least one way to, to describe the book. And then, um, so I've almost taken up my allocated 50 minutes. So, um, but the other, the other third subtitle is longing. Um, so it was very important for me not to write one more critique of international law. That had been done 
brilliantly before and in a pretty thrilling way by, by several other people. Um, I felt that we were ready to move into a new era of international legal thought. And so I, I, directed, I directed this book to my own uh, children and uh, their generation. I mean, as I said at a, a recent book launch in London, I, I may have written a, an international law book for children, though, though you know, no parent is ever going to read you know, chapter five on bathos to their, to their toddlers, are they? But I did, I did go into the uh, London Library about uh, six months ago and I, I, I saw a sign that said um, children's books and international law. And I, it made me wonder if I had written, I hadn't written a book in some ways for children, not so much for children, literally, but for a kind of childlike sensibility, which we possess when we enter the field. We then gain a kind of expert knowledge of the field and we have a habit of losing or disparaging that initially childlike view of the discipline. So students come to the class with all sorts of ideals often. They also come with lots of skepticism as well. And I'm not that keen on either of those. So I, I work on them becoming sort of uh, idealistic skeptics or, or chastened idealists. I don't know how I would, I would describe it, but I wanted to sort of hold on to that sort of childlike enthusiasm for the field and for the longing and hope that the field in, in, involved or embedded in people while allying it to what I take to be a, a, a sort of experience in the field and dare I say a sophistication about its you know, grammars and its moves and its arguments and structures and so on and so forth. So I wanted to put those two things together, um, not so much from apology to utopia, but apology and utopia at exactly the same time at all times. Um, so that was the idea to keep holding on. Now, in one of the reviews that's about to come out, um, somebody has accused me of actually speaking in two entirely different registers. So the, the first half of the book is full of a kind of hard hitting, um, scathing, ironic skepticism about international law. And then I, I go all soppy in the second half of the book um, and I start talking about friendship and gardening. And that was a really good point. I mean, I, I, I think uh, she's absolutely onto something um because i think i do sort of switch registers a bit i mean to a certain extent i try and hold on to the first idea as much as possible and i hope there's a certain um redemptive aspect or tone in each of the you know the each of the the early chapters but but certainly the book is is is, is, a, is a sort of conversation between these two these two cells and I, but I, I wanted to keep the utopian or sub-utopian or minor utopian idea alive, you know, throughout the book. And e even, even though some of it will seem contrived, uh, I kept that going. I, I maintained that sort of determination as I was writing the book and as I was thinking about it. And I also decided that I just didn't want to be ashamed of my own sort of sentimentality about the field anymore, that um, it seemed important to me also to hold on to that, to you know, risk, risk the ridiculous, if you like, risk the absurd and risk the soppy in my attempt to say something about the way um, I have thought about international law and the way I've experienced it um, through the last God knows how many years. So that was the that was the general idea. And um, the great thing is, you know, when I read the book uh, for events like this, I feel like I've pulled it off. You know, I, in previous occasions, I've sort of read through the books and think, I, you know, why did I, why did I speak like this, or why did I write like this, or who was I trying to imitate here? Um, I haven't had that experience with this with this book at all. I've, every time I've picked it up, I've thought, okay, I could have gone a bit lighter on the uh, on the literary allusions. I could have used a, a maybe a plainer language at times, uh, maybe a more Spartan style. And I, I, I can see all that. I suppose I might have toned that down a bit if I was writing the Sentimental Life of International Law, Volume Two. But um, but I don't really uh, have any regrets uh, about the way it's come out, the way it looks and the way it feels. So um, that's a good thing. Um, 
okay, so that's really all I want to say about the book at this stage. And I'd be, you know, happier entering into a conversation. But uh, Anke, it just occurred to me that you wanted me to, you wanted me to say something about what was in the book. Uh, however, how long have I spoken for already? We started at 2.30, didn't we? Well, 20 minutes, only 20 minutes. All right, well, let me take another, let me take another five minutes or so okay. to just say, you know, what's in the book. So the book's arranged, uh, well, as it turns out, around two distinct parts. Uh, there's, a, there's a part in which I um, think rather critically, I suppose, about international law. Um, and I have a chapter, uh, a sort of opening chapter uh, called The Sentimental uh, Life of the International Lawyer or something along those lines in which I sort of describe what's it, what it's like to be uh, or experience life as an international lawyer, what sort of images we might have of international law, what the biography slash autobiography of international lawyer might be, why there's this been, been this turn to autobi autobiography, and then what sentimentality might do or perform in the work we do. And then I have a, a couple of chapters on bathos and comedy. One the bathos chapter I've been working on for a long time. And in fact, I published in the collection that, that Amy Talgren and Thomas Scuteris wrote or edited a few years ago. But the comedy chapter was quite late in the piece. Um, and I was worried that there'd be too much overlap between the two. But I decided that international law did have a sort of broadly, broadly comic aspect or that comedy might be a useful way to think about it um, and um, that chapter tries to think about comedy in, in, in these two veins. One I call sort of ironic sardonic comedy and the other I call um, blasphemous. I was gonna call it hysterical, but that seemed somehow wrong. So I dropped that word uh, and I called it blasphemous comedy instead. And, and instead I put hysteria in a long footnote about Freud. So that was that. Um, and then there's a, um, a middle chapter on international legal method drawn from my appearance in the sort of history debates, trying to stake a place in those debates that wasn't formed around what I think of to be substantially theoretical interests in what method does to reading, but instead to think of reading as somehow more instinctive and sentimental enterprise, which reveals its own truths and preferences that aren't really known to method, or as I put it in the chapter heading after method uh, or against method, I can never remember which phrase I precisely used in the, in the title to this particular book. So then, then the, um, the essay ends with these two, with these two chapters on, on friendship um, with four sort of vignettes about friendship, one drawn from a modern opera on Nixon's visit to China, uh, which some people just found unpalatably indirect. Um, another features um, Khrushchev and Castro. A lot of people said I wasn't fair on Castro in that piece. Another one on Tito's friendship with Nehru uh, in Belgrade, a sort of uh, alternative um, bandung. So I had these, I had these various um, moments of friendship. And I tried to read friendship sort of through, partly through uh, Derrida's politics of friendship, partly through the sort of canon on friendship that I hadn't really been very strongly aware of until I began looking at this looking at this chapter, and this chapter was partly inspired by the thought that as international lawyers, we'd obsessed for centuries over um, enemies, um, neutrals, pirates, criminals, but we hadn't really turned our attention to what we might think would be an idealized version of inter-sovereign life based on friendship. Uh, friendship just doesn't really, doesn't seem to appear as a category, I mean, there is a declaration on friendly relations. And um, in fact, I sort of call my chapter a declaration on friendly relations in homage to that very, to that very declaration. Um, and then the final chapter uh, was on the power of imagination and utop utopian thoughts in international law. And I end that with a uh, sort of very gestural um, move towards uh, the idea of gardening, both 
in its figurative and literal dimensions. And, and you know, some people have just found that far too uh, bourgeois for their tastes. And I, I, I sort of understand, I understand that. So there we are, that's, that's the book, um, or at least that's a description of the book, or, or, or at least that's the, the, the sort of description of the book that I actually largely detest. Uh, the sort of capsule description of books is one of the things that I protest about in the book itself. So, but there we are. I've, I've undermined my own theoretical enterprise again. Dr. Madeline. Thanks, Ankit. Thanks, Gary. And thanks very much for having me here in what is nighttime for me as well. So I'm um, going to start my reflections on Gary's book with a story, uh, a sentimental story. So several years ago, I was at an international law conference. This is in pre-COVID days, uh, where one of the speakers in a large plenary session um, was arguing that we, his audience of international lawyers, have a duty to do certain things, to act in a particular way, to use our expertise to help people. And the theme of the talk was the, the existence of a duty. And I, I can't remember the details in particular, but it was all about duty. And during the, during the presentation, the speaker specifically referred to Gary Simpson's work on international criminal law as an example of the kind of international law approaches that the speaker disagreed with. And the speaker in particular was quite annoyed with Gary's argument about gardening um, and argued that that was deeply misguided and an example of international lawyers failing to live up to this duty that we have to the world, according to the speaker. So I found the speaker's argument about duty interesting un but unconvincing. And I also disagreed with the reading that they had presented of Gary's argument about gardening. So in question time, I raised my hand and I asked a question about the conception of duty and I presented a different reading of the work on gardening. Um, and so we had a little back and forth uh, and the speaker didn't have a really convincing response to my question. Uh, and from memory, actually, they, they didn't answer it and they asked the other panelists to respond. So we didn't get a satisfactory, I didn't get a satisfactory response to my critique um, of the... Uh, speaker's presentation and critique of Gary's work on gardening. But the next day, the speaker found me at the conference and overnight he had developed a response to my question and he wanted to talk about it. And so we proceeded to have a discussion uh, in the way that academics at a conference do. I was reminded of this story when I was reading, um, I mean, I've thought about the story a lot, but I reminded of it when reading many of the chapters of Gary's book, because I think that we can see it as a kind of microcosm of a lot of what Gary talks about. So the speaker and I were manifesting different ways of being international lawyers. So the speaker was a reformist, you know, here's how we fix international law. And I was being the critic skeptic, asking him questions. Uh, there was bathos in the speaker's acknowledgement that international criminal law had failed to live up to its promise. And there was irony in the fact that he nevertheless continued to press for this form of international criminal law, slightly reformed. Um, there was a really interesting kind of utopian sentimentality in the speaker's idea that this conception of duty could redeem international law somehow. And at the time, this idea of duty seemed to me to be hopelessly quaint and old fashioned um, and unconvincing. But as I was reading the book and thinking about this incident, I thought perhaps my response to that argument was limited by my own lack of imagination about what duty could mean. And then finally, my question to the speaker in response to their critique of Gary's argument um, was partly me being a particular kind of international lawyer, um, but it was also about friendship. So I thought that the speaker was being unfair to my friend and I sought to defend his work in this public forum. So it was a manifestation of an academic friendship, not the political friendship of the kind that Gary talks about in, the, in chapter six, but it was an act of friendship nonetheless. And so I'm telling you this story and doing this analysis as a way to illustrate um, how you can draw so much from this book, this micro event uh, at an international law conference and how it might help us to think and rethink, I think, our own practices as international lawyers through the various chapters of the book. 
Um, but with that in mind, I have a couple of questions. So one characteristic of Gary Simpson's work over the years has been very much this position of questioning, questioning the foundational assumptions of whatever it is that he happened to be thinking or writing about at the time. And we see that in the book. So in the book, um, Gary's arguing that we should be looking for what international lawyers miss, for example, if we fail to examine the ironies of the field, or he's arguing that we should try and look, find what we, what we can see if we pay attention to the emotions that we might otherwise disguise under the language of international law. Um, and he's asking us to think about the work that we can do, um, the work that we can do in international law if we write with an eye to method, but without being constrained by it, for example. And in this long trajectory of questioning work, much of which is evidenced in the book, um, Gary has always been cautious about what he calls making recommendations. So there's a little a funny aside, and I think it's in chapter one about he recommended a committee early on in his career or something like that, a committee, imagine. Um, and so for me, the most surprising aspect of this book, because I've heard bits and pieces of this and read parts of these over the years, but seeing it all together in one place is that actually it read to me like a manifesto. So um, not a manifesto of a call to political violence or revolution, but a very quiet, magnificently written manifesto that is an impassioned call for a different kind of international law and a different kind of international lawyer. Um, and so if we take the chapter on gardening, which is probably my favourite chapter, um, that in that chapter, the manifesto seems to kind of, and I, and I agree about the sort of two different kinds of, of voices that are going on in the book, but I think the gardening chapter brings it together. So it's a manifesto asking for an approach to international law that adopts, and this is sort of a semi-quote, the exterior glance, so a different view, combined with a relentless process of resistance, questioning and estrangement, so the defamiliarization that Gary's talking about in relation to our experience as international lawyers and the institutional and political arrangements that make those concrete. So my first question then with that long introduction is, did, did you mean to write a manifesto, Gary? <laughs> did you see it as a manifesto? Would you see it now as a manifesto? And what's your response to that description? So two other, two other points, and these are both about contexts. So we know as international lawyers that there are many places where international law takes place. So it's debated, it's argued, it's implemented. And in the book, Gary discusses types of international lawyers and types of international legal practices. Um, and I wanted to sort of, I want to dig a little deeper into the places where they might occur. So um, just just a range of contexts. So we could think of institutions, the General Assembly, the, the Security Council, the courts, uh, situations, treaty negotiations, diplomatic conferences, meetings, in my case, public debates <laughs> that contain international law, um, domestic contexts like government departments, foreign ministries, decision making by border guards, right? These really kind of um, uh, very fine grained on the ground places where international law takes place. And contexts like the one we're in now, meetings, classrooms, conferences. So in all of these contexts, international law works a little bit differently. And the types of international lawyer that one can be in those contexts shift. So, um, and there are some examples of this, I think, in the book. So if we think about Philippe Sands, who comes up a few times. So the Philippe Sands, who appears before the International Court of Justice, arguing about Chagos, uses a different international law to the Philippe Sands, who's writing East West Street. Right. So there's some there's a sort of shift across in these places where we might think of as international law happening. And similarly, in the chapter on friendship, where um, that looks into diplomacy, that is really a chapter on, on a particular view of diplomacy. It seems to me that diplomats and international lawyers do some of the what I what I think of as the shape shifting that Gary talks about. So they read between the lines in as diplomatic practice, understanding the significance of silence using comedy and tragedy to achieve particular aims as a practice of diplomacy. So I just wondered, Gary, if you would talk a little bit about the relationship between the modes that you talk about in the book and the kind of shape-shifting that international lawyers might already do across contexts and using different modes. 
And then finally, national context. So one of the descriptions that Gary gives of international law is that he calls it a cultural project in the book. And the obvious question in response to a description of something is a cultural project is, well, whose who's culture? Um, and the, the techniques in the book to defamiliarize international law, as Gary describes it, draw on a canon of writing that's largely Western and European. So Nietzsche, Yeats, West, Arendt, it's, it's, there's so many. And given international law's Eurocentrism, it seems intuitively right to me to use the tools of the empire to prize open the techniques of empire, right? But coming back to my idea of my reading of this book as a manifesto, then the question is how does a culturally specific manifesto translate in different places? Um, so just to give one example that I was thinking of when I was reading the chapter on humor or on irony, it's so humor is famously culturally specific. So, for example, as Australians, we, I know that my brand of sarcastic Australian humour doesn't translate very well in places like the United States where things are very literal, right? So we have to be aware of, how, of the jokes I make in different places. Um, and so I was wondering about irony and if, if irony works in the same place in different places or friendship and bathos work in the same way in different places and what difference it makes to reading the book to come with those different approaches. And so I thought in some senses it doesn't matter because so much of what happens in the book involves Gary's descriptions of irony, bathos, method, sentimentality to pull apart common understandings of international law and to kind of force us to look at them differently. Um, but, and so in a way, if the critique of international law makes sense to a reader, does it really matter where the critique comes from? Um, or if you don't really share what irony is in the same way, does it matter if it's still, you can use that as a technique to understand the argument? And I don't, I don't know, I'm curious about that. I'm curious about the translation across different, different places, I guess. Um, and then finally, I thought I would finish with another story. Um, someone, uh, so when Gary was at Melbourne Law School, he had a corner office with a lovely view. Uh, and great, beautiful, big windows and exposure to the sun. And he grew these long vines in the office. So we had a bit of a jungle going. And for a while, it was spectacularly successful. Um, and this very corporate, I don't know if anybody's ever been to Melbourne Law School, but this very corporate kind of sterile office um, exterior, when you open the door, was, you know, it was a jungle, at least on one side of the office. And then various things happened. I don't remember what they were. And I think Gary went away for some time and nobody watered his plants or something, but anyway, they died. Um, but in a way, I think the trajectory of the plants in Gary's office illustrates a lot of what happens in the book as well. So trying to cultivate those plants in that incredibly urban environment took imagination, a sense of irony, an understanding of the past, a commitment to a different future, and the success of the plants for a while, for as long as they were successful, unsettled all of our ideas about what could be achieved in the very sterile environment of the law school building. And the really important thing, and we can take this from the book, is that even though the plants died, Gary at least had tried. All right, I'm done. That's great. That's great. And can, can Ram, do you mind if I respond to some of this? Because otherwise I'll, I, won't remember, I won't remember what everyone said. So, um, yeah, that was great, uh, obviously. Um, sort of two anecdotes and three questions. Um, I like it. Uh, so much to think about. I mean, I, for a start, I, I, I do really like the idea of manifesto. I mean, I, I, I've come across this word at various points in my, in my career. And honestly, it just wasn't in circulation particularly when I thought about the book. Otherwise, it would have inevitably ended up on the title somewhere. I really do like the idea of owning it as a manifesto, because in a sense, it's quite strongly prescriptive. Um, it's sort of saying, do, do as I do. And that's both a strength and a weakness. You know, it's quite, it's quite strong. It sort of suggests that a particular way of thinking about the world um, you know, ironic, urbane, um, bathetic, and so on, is the way to look at the world, or at least, at least as a counterpoint 
to other more sort of familiar, perhaps deadlier languages and ways of thinking about the world. So there's no doubt every single line is an is an act of, sort of persuasion and prescription. Every single line is a sort of mini mini manifesto. It's not. It's certainly not. Um, it's not suggesting it, that it, it's some sort of a view from nowhere, but it's an argument against the view from nowhere. So it's certainly a view from somewhere. And I think you're right about that. I think a manifest is a very good word for it. I'm not really, it, for all my sort of indirect, heavily qualified stylistic tics, I'm really uh, every juncture uh, offering a sort of heavy duty prescription of how to, how to sort of how to live a life in international law and sort of saying, you know, how would it go if you did this or thought like this? And there are clear um, enemies that I identify in the book, uh, modes of thought that I happily see eliminated, ways of being that I've never liked, hypocrisies that I want to expose and so on and so forth. So that, that makes a lot of sense. But, um, but the problem is it does leave you slightly open just to go from your first anecdote to your last question about, and really it's the, it's the last two questions. It's about where, the where questions, you know, how does this work? And, and to be honest, the answer is that in a, in a way is yet, yet to be tested. It's certainly come in for some criticism in some places. You know, I had a very rough ride when I went to Galway of all places in Ireland and gave this talk and it just didn't, it didn't work at all. Uh, it was entirely the wrong audience. Uh, I got off to a thoroughly obnoxious start by, you know, referring to Yates and the fact that I just spent the night before in a large castle, which turned out to be a Protestant stronghold outside Dublin. So it's easy to misread the cultural conditions in which you're, um, in w which you're entering. Um, but I did want to understand international law also as its own culture, as you say, because, uh, you know, as we know, it's understood itself to be beyond or above culture, somehow acting on cultures. In fact, part of a project to replace culture, tradition and custom in the old fashioned sense of that word with projects of, of modernity and rationality. International law has been very much part of that. The International Rule of Law Project is, is part of that. So I wanted to sort of see international law as a culturally specific project. And I think this book is rather culturally specific too. And I just simply don't know the answer to the question about you know, how universalizable this kind of thinking is. I mean, I've been sort of gratified so far how many people have found it resonant but that might be a sort of tiny minority of of international lawyers never mind a tiny minority of people in the population and rather like your interlocutor in the first anecdote lots of people have also been sort of plain baffled by it um quite often i get two different views from people outside the field either they say um i didn't know this this is what international law was and, and i say it's not uh, I'm trying to make it like this. And I said, well, it, doesn't, I've, I've, it never occurred to me that this book would be anything like this. Almost everyone I've shown it to outside the field has said that. They said, this is not at all what I expected. I'm um, usually in a good way. But then there have been a sort of smaller group of people who've said, I don't really like this. This is not what I imagine international law to be. This seems too loose and light and playful and and frivolous. Uh, and indeed, last night at a party in King's Cross, I got into a really quite difficult argument precisely along those lines, not, not with somebody who would read my book, but, but with somebody who had a, a series of sort of familiar ideas about the war in Ukraine and the various sort of punitive ideas circulating about the war. So it was a quite, a, quite a sort of nasty discussion. Um, Funnily enough, at this uh, party in King's Cross last week, uh, last night, I also um, came across a French journalist who was asking me about the war in Ukraine from an sort of international law perspective. And I gave her my sort of five to 10 minute shtick on the war. And, and, and she said, you know, you sound, you sound exactly like Philippe Sands, except you're saying the very opposite of what he's saying. And um, that struck me as very funny because you've described Philippe as having this, sort of these two versions of himself. I'm not sure about that. I think his thinking is pretty consistent. And um, 
I've, you know, I've, I've often found myself saying that Philippe is wrong, but so, so right. You know, there's a sort of, there's a sort of, you can be sort of wrong about things, but you can be sort of fundamentally right in the background. In a way, I'm trying to appeal to people who I think of as sort of fundamentally right, whatever they say. I might disagree with them. I even disagree about their approach, even their politics, even their theoretical dispositions about international law, but there might be something fundamentally right about them. And, and, and equally, I know people who share my theoretical dispositions and so on, who I just don't think are somehow quite right. And that's very hard to articulate. And I suppose this, uh, this book is an attempt, this book's an attempt to do, the, to do that, to sort of speak to that, to speak to that very problem. Now, the sort of national, international thing that you've done sort of important work in, I didn't really think about that much. So the book is not particularly self-conscious about the nature of international and national space. I think if I read it in that light, I'd probably find things, uh, but, but I don't think I wrote it with that, with that awareness. Um, I think what I was trying to describe perhaps is the is the cosmopolitan space that international lawyers think that they inhabit. There's a, a lot of people's favorite part of the book, um, uh, certainly non-international lawyers, was a very, very lengthy footnote. It's a sort of joke footnote almost. It's about a page long. It's an imitation of those American Law Review footnotes. And it's a long description of my um, visit to the UN to give a, uh, to give a paper. Uh, and then it ends with a reference to some books on long footnotes and intertextuality. So, so that footnote uh, and much of the rest of the book is an attempt to, this, to, to sort of write about the placeless, cosmopolitan, single, small, walk-on trolley, international lawyer. Um, and yet, of course, I also argue against placelessness when it comes to writing. Um, so in, in the description of the person, the, the sort of cosmopolitan person, I'm trying to get at the, um, uh, the academy's view of itself as somehow placeless, but I'm constantly also both trying to ironize the effects of that and also in a way place myself. Though I don't do it in any strong sense, I don't really you know, strip away my identity as as you know, European, Scottish, Anglo, all of those things. It, it, it is revealed in the exchange between myself and other people about this book, though. You know, so in Ireland, I was revealed as a kind of Anglo Protestant Scot in a, a slightly surprising way, with a whole bunch of Anglo Protestant um, reference points. I mean, T.S. Eliot, for God's sake, and uh, and and Yeats. It's just never going to go down that well in a particular sort of Galway audience, but in, in other places, I've had different sorts of problems. So I think I have encountered difficulties at each in each iteration of this sort of project of launching the book. Um, and those themselves have just been very, very interesting to me in thinking about the book and what it means and what I was actually trying to say. So to go back to my first point, there are sort of two books. There's the book I wrote and the book that people read. And the book that people read is now being revealed to me uh, person by person. And it's clear that, that everyone is reading as a different book. I mean, there's a kind of core of book there, but uh, not to get too HLA heart on you, there's a huge penumbra of, of red book around it, which is slowly eating itself into what I thought to be the core um, suppositions of the book. So, um, yeah, that's that's my um, that's my sort of partial answer, uh, partial answer to your your question. But but yeah, it's a mixture of like like almost all international lawyering, I suppose. It's a, it's a, or, or anything really. It's a mixture of manifesto and description, or it's a it's a manifesto pretending to be. Uh, a, a, a descriptive project. So here I am sort of saying innocently, hey, all I want to do, back off people, is sort of describe the field. Um, I'm a complete innocent. I'm just using some literary techniques. They're very, very neutral. No one could possibly object to them. And I'm going to sort of describe how people go about doing their, doing their work, um, take it or leave it. But, but behind this take it or leave it-ness, 
is a kind of as as you say is this is this is this sort of prescriptive um manifesto uh position but i think manifesto captures the broad ranging aspects of it that perhaps other words that other words don't it's not exactly a sort of reform proposal um is it nor is it sort of flatly utopian nor is it quite a political pamphlet a manifesto i think captures the idea both that this has possibly a a universal if not community appeal but also somehow is somebody's very particular ideas about the world you here's my manifesto and you sort of look on this idea say well, manifesto well, let's have a look at your manifesto there and see how much of it makes sense to me so it captures that sort of partial aspect to it, i think the word manifesto it's marvelous i'm going to borrow it in fact steal it and pretend you never said it uh rob You'll have to unmute. Thank you, Professor. Thank you, Madeline. Thank you, Ankit. Uh, today, I find myself vastly underqualified amongst this panel, but I'm going to try and stake a little claim to this book, and I'm going to try and justify why my presence here today is not only good, but perhaps a necessity. And this I'm not doing, saying out of hubris, but perhaps because of two reasons. Firstly, because I have been associated, since I was associated with Professor Simpson in 2017, uh, with, where I was uh, reading under him, um, I have had the pleasure of discussing with Professor Simpson and with nine others of my brilliant class fellows, where also I felt very underqualified. Uh, it's Professor Simpson's ideas about sentimentality and international law, as it were. To be very honest, initially, I found myself quite out of place, as I am feeling right now, in that setting as well. But it is perhaps because of Professor Simpson's um, patience in me and my intrigue in international law as a literary exercise or as, as an exercise of sentimentality that I stuck on and didn't jump ship. And, and I'm glad I, I didn't at this point. But more importantly is the second reason. I, I feel, and this is where I'm going to stake a little bit of claim to Professor Simpson's book. Um, the, the reason I stake a little bit of claim to this book is because of who I am. I am a traditional lawyer, and, and I believe this book is sort of a communication, a, a commentary on and about traditional lawyers, uh, lawyers who um, are steeped in the legalese of law, someone who is viewing the law through statutes, through legislations, through treaties, and through case law, and is unable to see the perhaps the realities of international law as if they were. So it's almost as if it is a commentary about international law and the actors, including the international lawyers about it. So in that sense, it's biographical in, in, in a sense. Um, and which is why perhaps it's important for someone like me, who is a traditional lawyer who studied international competition law, in international arbitration law, and international refugee law, to take a jump, a deep dive into rethinking international law where we were dealing with senti the sentimental life of uh, international law and international lawyers. Uh, I, I recollect distinctly after one of my classes, so I, I would have a class with Dr. Chaloka Bayani on international refugee law, where we would deal article by article on how refugee law was and how it was applied. And right after that, I would take a deep dive into Professor Simpson's class where you would discuss inter alia, his books is, as well as some of the texts he had written. And I remember discussing with some of my friends from the class, how it felt almost as if you were taken out of your bodily presence and uh, thrown into a cloud of imagination and dreaming almost because it was it was almost disconnected from my reality as a practitioner and from what he spoke um, ironically enough unbeknown to me at the time when I was recently uh, going through his preface again 
um, it seems almost as if this is Professor Simpson's intention to take the reader out of their, the reader who, according to me, ought to be that international lawyer steeped into the legalese and the treaties and the case law and pull him out of there and possibly show him a different uh, view, a different dimension of international law. Um, and, and I remember, and, and I'll just quote a, the, a line from his preface where he says, this book in a way dwells in the cloud miles above the cut and thrust of international legal life and unlikely candidate for removal if the libraries are perched. I think that speaks, uh, that's, that spoke to me and, and that, that brought back that distinct memory of mine where after class you we were just discussing how in order to grasp these concepts, how we had to sort of take a step back and possibly how Professor calls it taking a pastoral look of international law. Um, and, and that really stuck to me. But then he continues on in his preface and he writes about how, how this book is fundamentally against the idea that bodies of law exist in a space detached from earthbound lives of international lawyers. So I think the two of them, when they come together, they present a really wonderful picture, which is that we as international lawyers or we as lawyers in general, even municipal, I, I would believe all his observations are equally applicable to municipal law as well. We as international lawyers are incapable possibly of looking at a world beyond the lens of the law. And, and in our um, hubris as lawyers to look at the world through law legislation treaties, we seem to assume incorrectly that this reflects or this ought to reflect how the world is or how it ought to be, which is often not the case. Um, I, and I think that these quotes are the best description of, of this book. And um, uh, yeah, talking more about the book, this book, then when, when you read this book, that you're, you're dealt into a completely uncharted territory of dealing with international law in its linguistic um, area, in its, in, its, in its imaginative definition, in, in uh, its stylistic enterprise, uh, which, which ordinarily perhaps the audience, if it were international lawyers or traditional lawyers would not, sorry, would not be very familiar with. So in, in that sense, it, this book is a, is a sort of revelation to international lawyers and lawyers themselves who are now shown a different dimension of how you could possibly approach international law or law is in general. I, 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 I remember reading Khrushchev's letter, the, 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 Professor Simpson had just discussed Khrushchev's letter to Castro during the Cuban Missile Crisis. Uh, I, I remember reading that letter and this was one of my favorite classes that along with um, Amish's um, uh, uh, piece on um, nuclear, new, the nuclear warfare, along with the Cuban Missile Crisis, just opposed with um, Kessinger's notes on, on his communications with the president at the time and, and, and the confidential notes that were sent up and forth. And, and the lack of sensitivity possibly or sense, sense sentimentality in uh, Kessinger as opposed to sentimentality that was steeped in and almost communicated through um, uh, Kissinger's work where he, he, he's on a train and he's discussing his flora, fauna and, and the climate as he's trying to almost pacify and uh, control um, a, a more um, angry uh, Castro at the time. When, when he had refused to go to Castro's line. At the same instance, I'm reminded of, uh, and I believe this finds part of the book as well, of when Trump speaks about his love letter from Kim Jong-un and, and the huge letter that he had gotten, the one that he hadn't read, but, but the sentiment behind it and how that was supposed to influence people's realities or views or visions about how the relations between America and uh, North Korea ought to progress or were progressing in a particular direction, despite the fact that he had possibly not even read the letter. So sentimentality clearly does play a role in uh, 
how international law is formed, how it is developed and how it is delivered more than possibly we as lawyers would like to admit or more, more than possibly the United Nations uh, would like to admit or, or just academics would like to admit. And I think this is that unique perspective that uh, is often lacking in a lot of international treaties, which is why I called it a biography of international law. This is not a book on international law. This is more a book about international law, about international lawyers and surrounding atmospheres. And uh, the relevance of this is also I re recollect from uh, my past lectures and professors works about how it's not necessarily the conference that plays a role in developing international law. It's not necessarily the states that play a role. It's possibly the canteen in the conference that plays more of an important role in developing this international law. And until and unless we recognize that soft power, possibly it be not possible for us to really understand what international law is. And at the same instance, um, Nehru and India sort of finds its way into professor's work uh, through uh, Nehru and the NAM, non-aligned movement, in his chapter on friendship. However, I also connect this to his final chapter where he's talking about pastoral pursuits and not answering binary answers because often you pose a binary answer, a question that requires you a yes or no answer in international law. Uh, um, uh, Professor Simpson sidesteps that completely and says, I'd rather not answer it. And I felt that Nehru sort of did that when he said, I'm neither going to talk about the US nor the USSR, we're going to talk about the NAM, which is a completely different thing altogether. And um, so, and, and finally, I was also reminded about um, Modi's, uh, Prime Minister Modi's uh, bear hug diplomacy and how that has played a role and how initially that was a sort of taboo, but now it's played a major role in India's soft power towards international relations and how every international partner in India meets is, is greeted with a bear hug. In um, conclusion, I'd, 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 I'd only say that if after reading this book, the two clear signs you'd get out of it is that firstly, um, this is a completely new dimension, the new way of possibly looking at international law, especially from a practitioner's point of view. And secondly, possibly in a lighter note, uh, Professor Simpson's deep love for gardens and garden. With that, I'll... Uh, give it to Ankit again. Uh, let me give it to Professor Simpson. Thanks for that, Ram. That was great. Really good. I was, it, was, it was particularly good to hear about the course from all those years ago because I, you know, I developed, in some ways I developed some of these arguments out of three versions of this course called Rethinking International Law, which I taught as a kind of sentimental life of international Law and which had a relatively small. I, I, I timed the course so that very few people would come to it. I, 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 I had it between 7 p.m. and 9 p.m. on a Monday night, uh, and the people who were at the timetables who half wanted us to do odd times so that they didn't have to find rooms in difficult moments in the week, but were half amazed that anyone would actually want to teach between seven and nine. So I, I, I used to end up with about you know 10 students. Uh, in fact, it was it was. 10 every single year and this meant we had a kind of therapeutic session every monday night about international law uh, reading usually one or two pieces often stuff like uh the khrushchev uh, castro exchange so um i have very fond memories of that the, the course was a victim like so much else of covid and i'm working hard to revive it now because also like so much of COVID, it's been a good excuse to get rid of this sort of stuff. But I think I have a, I have a sympathetic ear in the, uh, in the faculty now and I might, I might be bringing rethinking back. So it was good to, it was good to hear all that. I just um, wanted to pick up a couple of things. Uh, well, one certainly was the, the, the point about canteens. Yeah, I, I do make a point about micro politics in the book, but that the international law is more than what's going on in the room. It's in fact, to a large extent, what's going on unseen outside the room. And, and you know, ordinary I mean, diplomats will tell you that anyway. 
And so I wanted to capture this idea of international law's unconscious, if you like, that we spend a lot of time on its conscious life, just as, just as we focused on, on the conscious life of human beings for millennia until, until Freud came along. And now, we, now we, we're ready to think about what the un unconscious or neurotic makes of us or produces in us. And I felt I wanted to do something for, uh, I wanted to do something for international law along those lines. I also wanted to make an argument against relevance. You, talk, you talked about relevance at one point and, and a target of the book is the need to be, the desire to be relevant or to have an impact. I call the book the most useless book in the history of international law at one point. And I, um, I worried about that as a sentence. It seemed, seemed a bit coy um, and perhaps trivializing, but because it was coy and trivializing, I stuck it in and, and, and left it and it felt fine afterwards. And now people quote it quite a lot of these things. They say, this is the most useless book in, in the history of international law. Uh, ha ha. And, and various people in the room look completely baffled by that too. Um, so it was a, it was an argument about relevance, but I wanted to, or I have now got a much more generous view of what people do generally in the field. So, um, I'm not sort of looking down my nose at a lot of people burrowing away in domestic law or doing doctrinal work or whatever it is. That's, that's really not, not the intention. It's not supposed to come across as that sort of critical work. I sort of became you know, slightly fed up with that. But, but you made an interesting move between or what I take to be the kind of concrete circumstances of international law and the sort of airiness of some of the dream, dreaminess of some of the work that we were doing in class. And I suppose um, the book moves back and forth between those two attitudes to go back to sort of Maddie's uh, sort of anthropology of international law, if you like, that, that what's happening on the ground. I, I wanted to be attuned to that materiality or anthropology. And there's a lot of work being done in international law on that stuff, sometimes literally on material objects as in the objects of international law, sometimes more ethnographic like Luis Slava's work in Colombia and so on. Uh, and then at the other at the other end, we have um, the sort of utopian speculations. And my book in a way moves back and forth between those two and tries to steer clear of what I take to be a middle ground of applying international legal doctrine to pre-existing problems of international law, pre-assigned problems of international law. There's less of that and more of the two extremes. And there's also something else, I think, there's a, there's a sort of eye on, you talked about Kissinger and Castro. I think really the book continues to reflect my preoccupations with global politics and indeed international relations as a discipline. So it's got a kind of literary theory side to it. It's got a sort of materialism aspect to it. And it continues to have this slightly old fashioned, um, uh, perhaps unpopular sort of strategic studies aspect, because after all, I was partly educated in that. And my first book on great powers was, was sort of steeped in that tradition, if you like. IR people really liked it for that. Um, I, international law people were less sure that that was the right direction for the discipline. And I, I sort of sympathize with that. So, but this book sort of keeps an eye on all that. And, you know, to go back to, back to Ukraine, I, I've always thought of those three ideas, the material, the, the utopian and the strategic has been really quite promising ways to think about Ukraine, but we seem to be stuck in a kind of doctrinal populist propagandist middle ground of going on and on about territorial integrity, political independence, and so on and so forth, war crimes. And that's, that seems to me to be mm, slightly Mono, monolithic, monodirectional, however you want to look at it, look at it. So yeah, the book is doing a lot of things. And you know, as with as with um, Maddie's comments, I just, I just feel myself to be sort of reading it differently in the light of that and immediately wanting to sort of scribble out a chapter. Um, but I tried this once before. I wrote, I was asked to write an article called 10 Years On about my Great Powers book for the for a, for a journal in the Netherlands. And it just did not come off. It, it, somebody, one of the reviewers said, yeah, you know, publish it. But it, it seems to me to be a bit of a decline from the standards of the book. And uh, I completely agree with that. But I was, you know, I was assailed by other factors at that time. And I just, I, I published it. I published it anyway. But, but, but so, so I think I could, produce a much richer a reflection on my experience 
publicizing and thinking and talking about the um, about the sentimental life of international law. Um, uh, just one last thing before we before we finish, Ankit. Uh, Ashish has uh, asked a couple of questions in the chat, and I'm, I d don't really have time to answer them um, in any realistic way. Uh, um, but I saw I saw it, um, and he talks about how he had a similar experience with Chiloka and I um, in the uh, in the program. And he also asks about the war crimes trial, the relationship between war crimes trials and museums. I mean, obviously, I'm very interested in thinking about how international law might work through, again, through its material objects, you know, commemoration, museums, and so on. People do do work. People do work on that. But if international law is a sort of memorializing, commemorative, linguistic idea, as it is in international criminal law, then the answer is that then at least part of the implication of taking it in that direction is to say, well, why not all of this stuff too? If it's really not just about criminal justice, and even the most hard-headed international criminal lawyer can't with a straight face say that it is, if it's about more than that, if it's about some symbolism and expressivism and didacticism, et cetera, et cetera, all the other isms, then it has to encompass a much bigger picture from truth commissions to receding monuments in the in the post-war German tradition um, to, to Ashish's museum. And I think I didn't get a chance to read your question carefully enough, Ashish, but you mentioned the war crimes trial that's taking place in the Ukraine at the moment, in, in Ukraine at the moment. What an exercise in bathos this 18-year-old Russian soldier um, is providing us. You know, here he is, this this sort of slightly emaciated figure is supposed to represent all the terrible things that are being done um, in Ukraine. You can feel chapter three sort of hovering, chapter four sort of hovering over this, over this individual um, in, that, in that particular moment. But uh, yeah, that's, 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 that's really, I think, all I have to say. I know it's getting very late for you, Maddie, and uh, I think we were repeating some of this in, in, in Lisbon and uh, you really don't have to do any more now after that introduction. So uh, that's it. I'm, I'm, I'm happy to say something completely different in response to it, but uh, that was that was marvelous. Both of you, Ram and, and Maddie, just great comments. And uh, I, you know, every time I do one of these things, I think, do I really have anything more to say about this book? Uh, I think, uh, and Ankit said, you know, can you speak for 50 minutes? I thought, There's no way I can do that. But now I discover I probably could speak for 50 minutes on the back of these extraordinarily probing um, questions and comments that you've both made. So, yeah, thank you for that. It's great. Ram. Thank you so much, Professor. Well, let me join Ram in thanking you, Professor, for doing this, for writing this. And uh, uh, I look forward to our future interactions, hopefully physically. And uh, I'd also like to thank Dr. Adeline for taking out time to do this. Uh, this discussion has been truly global, uh, as I hope international law continues to be as well. Uh, Professor, I'll hand over the uh, floor to you for the final time. and. Uh, any parting words or any words of wisdom from your end? And what is next for international law and the sentiments? Boy, those are big questions to finish with. <laughs> um, well, I'm, I'm, I mean, I, I don't know what's next for international law, but for me, I'm, I'm now writing a, a book on the Cold War uh, with a couple of colleagues of mine. Um, and I think I'm going to take a more sort of memoirish turn in my book. I think I'm going to go the full autobiography. It's sort of promised in the sentimental life, and it it may happen. But I also have have uh, after after Ukraine, I've sort of got a revived interest in the way that this language moves um, around, uh, especially amongst po political elites. And I could, you know, I feel a sort of book on this particular crisis developing. But on the other hand, I don't want to write a book on Ukraine and international law. So I'm left with yet another of my puzzles to, to try and sort out on the train down to visit my mother this afternoon. So, Well, if I can tempt you to do a chapter, I'll be most delighted. 
<laughs> well, uh, let me thank everyone for taking our time to do this. Uh, it's been a riveting discussion. It's always a pleasure to have Professor Simpson amongst us and also Dr. Madeline and, and Ram. Um, thank you so much, everyone, and good evening. Thank you all. Thank you. See you, Ram. See you, Ankit. See, see you, Maddie. Thanks, Barry. Thanks, Thanks very much, everyone. Hey, just just one second. Are you still there? I'm still here, but I think it's recording. I so, oh, I see. We should we shouldn't speak. Well, I was, I was just going to say. I think that would be a really good way to do the uh, Lisbon thing. So uh, we we won't say any more because we're going out to thousands and thousands of people around the world right now. But that's okay. <laughs> It's all about yeah. the subconscious aspects of international law, after all. There's a hidden hidden history of our particular encounter. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> all right, but pure gossip would probably be inadvisable. Okay, I'll see I you. I think so. <laughs> see you both very soon. Bye. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye, Maddie.